to see you all here today. The Carl A. Scott Memorial Lecture is one of our signature events, and um, we're in for a treat. So I am going to now introduce Dr. Sandra Emmons Crew, who is the dean at the Howard University School of Social Work, because she is going to tell us a little something about Carl A. Scott, for whom the lecture is named. Dr. Crew. Good morning. When we think of frontiers of change, we uh, naturally think of Carl Scott. Mr. Carl A. Scott was a champion of equity and social justice and social work education. He was born in Battle Creek, Michigan in 1928. He received his bachelor's degree in psychology in 1950 from, the Howard, from Howard University. And additionally, he received his MSW in 1954 from the Howard University School of Social Work. It should not go unnoticed that Carl Scott studied during the time of the Brown versus Board of Education uh, legislation that we should really pay attention to. So he was a part of the early civil rights movement. Early in his career, he held practice and administrative positions in child and family services agencies and was the director of admissions and the assistant director at the New York University School of Social Work. In 1968, he joined the staff of the Council on Social Work Education as a senior consultant on minority groups. Scott was at the helm of CSWE's early efforts to foster diversity in social work education. He also designed minority fellowship programs to prepare mental health researchers and clinicians. He wrote an ed a number of edited uh, journals, and also he is the author of the seminal work, Ethnic Minorities in Social Work Education. According to the inaugural chair of the Carl A. Scott Memorial Lecture, uh, Professor Emerita Dorothy Pearson, Mr. C Scott continued his focus on the needs of African Americans throughout his lifetime. Dr. Pearson reminded me a couple weeks ago that when I came to the faculty of the Howard University School of Social Work, she assigned me to the door work to collect money for his scholarship. And she reminded me that we still need to give. And that was a, an important assignment that we all have to support the life of the work of his life. In preparing for these remarks, I decided to visit his MSW file at Howard University to see how do you create such a legend. And reading the summary of his readiness to graduate from Howard, I noticed a few remarkable statements about him. He stated, uh, his academic advisor stated that he was intelligent, mature, responsible and had a natural ability to relate to people. He, he had also said that he questioned authority in a mild and gentle manner. Additionally, it said that his characteristics were that, that he would become a change agent. And indeed, he is a change agent for us today. His collaborative work speaks for him. We owe a debt of gratitude to him. I owe a debt of gratitude to him for his lifelong commitment to ensuring that social work educators come from diverse races and ethnicities. To him, what was paramount was providing a workforce that was, in the words of my colleague, uh, Dr. Uh, Edwards, culturally intelligent. He wants us to be culturally intelligent. As the dean of the Howard University School of Social Work, I'm especially pleased to call him one of our own a Howard prepared social worker. I now introduce our former dean, Dr. Cador L. Snell, and now the new assistant provost for international programs at Howard University. Good morning. Thank you. It is now my pleasure to, inter to announce the 2015 Carl A. Scott Memorial Fund Book Scholarship 
winners. And if they are here, we'll ask them to please stand. Uh, Christian Glover. Christian Glover. Christian Glover is an MSW student at California State University, Long Beach. She will graduate spring 2016 and wants to work with survivors of domestic violence and sexual assault and do policy work that gives more visibility and support to survivors. Our second uh, winner is Angie Hanna, who is an MSW student at Columbia University. She will graduate spring 2016 and desires to better understand and help women who have been violently oppressed by family or community misogynistic cultural values embedded in everyday life. The Carl Scott Memorial Fund was established as a means for providing two annual $500 book scholarships to honor Carl Scott. Recipients are bachelor or master social work students in the final year of their program who are committed to addressing issues of social justice. The Memorial Fund, as Dean Ku uh, mentioned, depends upon donations. Please consider making a donation today Donations can be made via cash or check today, or by credit card and check at a later date. You should have uh, seen some of the donation flyers at the door as you came in, and there are boxes, so we hope that you will generously support the Book Scholarship Fund in uh, Carl Scott's memory so that other students can continue his legacy work in social justice. Uh, I would like now to recognize the Carl A. Scott Memorial Fund Review Committee members. Uh, the committee reviews and scores applications for the book scholarships, and I know some of them are here today, so I'd like you to stand so we can recognize you as I call you by name. Dr. Ruby Gordine. Dr. Rashmi Gupta. Dr. Sadie Logan. Dr. John Matsuoka, Dr. Gita Mahotra, Dr. Edward Mullen, Dr. Susan Neely Barnes, Dr. Gwenelle O'Neill, Dr. Robert Ortega, Dr. Michelle Roundtree. I think Dr. Gordine is the only one on the committee this year. Thank you, Dr. Gordine, for representing uh, the committee. A special thank you to Dr. Geraldine Meeks for her support as director of the Minority Fellowship Program and for her support of the scholarship process. Thank you. <laughs> Dr. Meeks is surrounded by her mentees, her former fellows, so will you please stand so we can acknowledge your presence here as well today. Thank you. It is now my pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Ruth McCoy, who is the chair of the Council on Social Work Education's Commission for Diversity and Social and Economic Justice. Dr. McCoy will introduce our speaker, but she can come forward to the podium now as I introduce her. I'm not going to do justice to the introduction, but you can always Google her as I did, <laughs> or look her up on the, on the Boston College uh, website. Uh, but Dr. Ruth McCoy is the first Donna Yu and De Felice endowed professor at Boston College of Social Work. Prior to joining the Boston College faculty, Dr. McCoy was a member of the University of Texas at Austin School of Social Work faculty for 25 years and held the Ruby Lee Priester Centennial Professorship. Dr. McCoy is well known for her research and publications in the area of child welfare. She received her BA and MSW degrees from the University of Kansas and her PhD degree from the University of Texas at Austin. Dr. McCoy, thank you. Good morning. I'm very honored to have the opportunity this morning to introduce the this year's Carl A. Scott Lecturer. John Wallace holds the Philip Kellen Chair in Community Health and Social Justice at the University of Pittsburgh. Dr. Wallace is a professor at Pitt School of Social Work with secondary appointments in the Katz Graduate School of Business 
and in the Kenneth Dietrich School of Arts and Sciences. He is also the senior pastor of Bible Center Church located in Pittsburgh's Homewood neighborhood. So we're gonna hear a preacher today. <laughs> this is great. <laughs> His teaching, research, and practice all use community-based participatory approaches to investigate and ameliorate social problems that disproportionately impact economically disadvantaged children, families, and communities. His research has been published in numerous professional journals, books, and monographs. He is the founder of Homewood Children's Village in Pittsburgh. In addition to being a professor and pastor, Dr. Wallace is also a husband and father. He has been married to his wife, Cynthia, for over 28 years, and together they have four adult children. He earned his master's degree and PhD in sociology from the University of Michigan. He received his degree in his undergraduate in sociology from the University of Chicago. He has dedicated his life and work to ameliorating social problems and to promoting racial and economic justice. Who better to have is our Carl A. Scott lecturer this year. Please join me in welcoming Dr. John Wallace. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I told Ruth, uh, unless I can take an offering, I'm going to be the professor this morning. The pastor doesn't come out right there to give me the point. Now, if I can take an offering, we can go all the way there. I'll take my. <laughs> He's saying offering for Carl Scott. <laughs> So if I take a picture of, of you all, is that a y'all leaf? <laughs> all right. I, I'm actually putting my phone out because, um, like, in, in church, you don't know this about pastors, you put your phone out because often your wife will text you stuff like, wrap it up. <laughs> <laughs> That's enough. You know. So I put my phone out. I'm not really watching the time. Well, first of all, I have to do some acknowledgments. I want to, of course, thank you for getting up this morning. I know it's early, and uh, this is Denver, and there's a whole lot to do on Friday nights, more than other places, actually. So the fact that you're here, and I'm assuming sober, I'm glad uh, <laughs> that you got up to hear and come this morning. Of course, I want to thank the children and the families that are not here, but the people with whom and for whom I work in the neighborhood of Homewood. Uh, of course, my community partners, Operation Better Block, the Homewood Children's Village, Bible Center Church, and a variety of other nonprofits in Homewood, my colleagues at the University of Pittsburgh, of course, our dean, uh, Larry Davis, creates a context for us to be able to do the kind of work that we're doing. Tracy Soska, who knows everybody. Tracy, like, almost introduced me to my mom. He knows so many people. You know what I'm saying? She's like, you know this guy? Like, Thanks, Trey. Uh, of course, the colleagues who before I came to the University of Pittsburgh, uh, had already prepared the way and made the University of Pittsburgh the amazing place that it is connected to community. Uh, so thank them for that. Of course, the reviewers for um, the Scott Award are receiving this morning, and of course our funders who uh, make the work a whole lot easier than trying to teach and do it nights and weekends. Right? So let's, um, let's jump into it. So overview of the talk, we're gonna talk about Pittsburgh, a tale of two cities. It's important to understand Pittsburgh and how it operates to really grasp uh, the significance of the kind of work we're trying to do. Next, I want to talk about the University of Pittsburgh, uh, a little play on words about the work they're doing. Finally, the translation of research into action. Of course, the reason we're all in social work is because we like to do stuff. And so I want to give you just some examples of the work that we do and perhaps uh, try to leave some time at the end so people have questions and provide some insight and maybe a little further to it. All right, so first of all, 
Pittsburgh. Uh, the economist names Pittsburgh the most livable city on the mainland again, second only to Honolulu, Hawaii. Now, given that Honolulu and Hawaii, of course, is a, uh, a destination for travel and visitors, pretty impressive, right? Um, next, Condé Nast, the sort of travel magazine, top 15 places to go in 2015. Pittsburgh. Oh, it gets better. Pittsburgh named one of the most livable cities in the world. This was in July 2015 by Metropolis Magazine. Now, for those of you who haven't been to Pittsburgh, you know, haters hate. But uh, <laughs> although, hold on, it, it, gets, it gets interesting. And then there's a bunch of other Pittsburgh kudos. If you, you know, if you fact checking me right now, that's fine. You Google Pittsburgh, most affordable, bikeable, hikeable, smartest, well-read, the healthcare is great, tech savvy, all kind of wonderful things, stunning views and so forth. And to some extent, that's very true. But then uh, 2015, uh, our dean put out a report, Pittsburgh's racial demographics, talking about Pittsburgh and the ways in which perhaps it's not as livable for everyone. And so I'll give you an example. And Pittsburgh African Americans are significantly less likely than whites to say that the region is a good place to live. So while a little bit more than half of Pittsburgh's African American population says Pittsburgh is either a good, very good, or excellent place to live, pressing about 90% of whites feel that way. Let's keep going. In Pittsburgh, African Americans' income is less than 50% of whites. And it's not like whites' income is all that high. So you're talking about $21,800 a year. That's about $10.24 an hour in the city of Pittsburgh. In the city of Pittsburgh, African Americans' unemployment rate is two and a half that, times that of whites. And so while our unemployment rate now is actually probably below 6%, African Americans' unemployment rate remains significantly higher than that, both in the city, the county, and the MSA. In Pittsburgh, African Americans are significantly less likely than whites to own their homes. Only about a third of Pittsburgh's African Americans own homes, even though Pittsburgh is actually quite an inexpensive place to buy. In Pittsburgh, African Americans' homicide rates are 14 to 30 times that of whites. So if you're comparing the city or at the county level, uh, you see for whites, it's uh, two per 100,000 for African Americans, 64.5. Uh, these data come from a recent report from the Social Science Research Council on disconnected young people. I've highlighted Pittsburgh there in red uh, overall, so the, the first column is the percentage of kids who are neither 16 to 24, who are neither uh, in school nor employed. And so you see nationally it's about 15%. Boston is doing very well. Come down the list, Pittsburgh's number six, but if you look across the row and look at race, 26% of African-American young people are disconnected compared to only 9.4% of whites, and that's the largest uh, racial disparity among the top 25 cities. Uh, the workforce participation, if you look at the list there, you see some cities that you, you know, and you come down and you see Pittsburgh is second uh, from the bottom above Minneapolis, and I won't say our host city's name. 89% um, of the people in the workforce in the city of Pittsburgh are African American, even though in Pittsburgh, 26% of the population is African. And you see the other thing that's sort of startling is the limited diversity. So only 2% of the population in the workforce are Hispanic, 2% Asian, and the 1% nebulous other. This is a map of the city of Pittsburgh, uh, the shaded areas using the Annie Casey criteria of distressed communities. Um, Pittsburgh's distressed communities, you can see, I think that's a, a red, I'm colorblind, so part that's not blue. All right, so these are some of the metrics. Poverty that, it, that is at or exceeds 27%. Male unemployment, 34% uh, or higher. Dropout rate higher than 23%. And female headed households more than 37%. Now, pay attention to kind of where those um, parts of the city or those neighborhoods are. Now, this is uh, shows the um, vacancy rate over 12 months. So these are houses not that somebody's waiting to buy them, but they're legitimately vacant. You know, the kind like, any, anybody know Midnight Plumbers? Do we have those in your city? You know Midnight Plumbers? People kicking doors and steal the plumbing. <laughs> so by the time your house is empty for a year, 
You don't have midnight plumbers where you from? All right. <laughs> Let's keep going. So those are the houses. The point is those houses are legitimately vacant, not waiting for somebody to show it and come Sunday open and all that, right? Uh, youth involved in children, youth and family services, kind of a heat map showing the density of folks using the services. Um, the homicide by neighborhood, you see the neighborhoods are shaded with the yellow being those that have experienced 22 to 42 homicides over the time period. Actually, that's uh, where my church is, where I was born and raised, and uh, where our work emanates in the Homewood neighborhood. Uh, another map that shows the uh, chronic delinquency or chronic absenteeism in the city of Pittsburgh by neighborhood. Pittsburgh is, like much of the nation, extremely racially segregated. And so where you see the black, those are neighborhoods that are 75 to 100% African American and so forth as they get lighter. And the reason that so much of it is white is because so much of it is white. This shows where people uh, live in Pittsburgh. And so African Americans in Pittsburgh live in high poverty neighborhoods. And it's almost striking the parallel in that for African Americans, 60% of them live in neighborhoods that are 20% or more high poverty, which is kind of the poverty metric. And if you kind of jump over to the right, you see that 62% of whites live in neighborhoods that are less than 10% high poverty. And so they're literally mirroring one another, only flipped. And so the majority of Pittsburgh's African American population lives in high poverty neighborhoods. This is one of the most striking. So this is a graph that shows poverty among children in the city of Pittsburgh, or in the nation actually, the largest cities in the nation, uh, the poverty rates. I'm going to take a sip of water while you absorb. Now, this is amazing. So Pittsburgh has one of the highest childhood poverty rates in the nation, a little bit over 60, about 62%. Even more striking, this is the rate for Pittsburgh's white children, less than 15%. So we're talking about a poverty rate four times greater among African Americans than whites. And so while Pittsburgh is indeed most livable for some, for many others it is very much not that. And so the stark contrast, and literally because you, and when you take into account the nature of residential segregation where people don't even realize the magnitude of these differences. And so people be like, what's wrong with them? It's like, you don't understand, we're literally talking about two distinct worlds. All right, so quick review. The data show, data are plural, therefore they show, right? Datum is singular, so it shows, all right? So the data show that Pittsburgh is the most livable city in America, perhaps the world for some. Poverty is an important reason that Pittsburgh is not most livable for all. Poverty is concentrated in specific neighborhoods as well as are its consequences. Efforts to make Pittsburgh's most livable for all should concentrate on high poverty. I never really understood why people try to fix concentrated problems with scattershot solutions. You ever ask yourself that? So we'll get some money, and then we spread it all over the place, and it does nothing. And then we're surprised. Like It's like if you were going to take a neighborhood, uh, the city, and you had crime in its pockets, but you say, we're going to take the worst criminal out of every neighborhood. You know what that would accomplish? Absolutely not. And so the work that we're doing is focused on a neighborhood. Let's talk about it a little bit. So this idea of the University of Pittsburgh, really university community partnerships between the university, the school, social work, our center on race and social problems, community organizations, and residents. Uh, really the integration, you see the little three-legged stool there, right? The university is the integration of research, teaching, and service. And so our work seeks to integrate the three pieces of the work, applied research, actionable knowledge, educational immersion experience, so we teach a community-based participatory research class, go figure, actually in the community. If you've ever been to Pittsburgh, you know that the Cathedral of Learning is the ivory tower. And so how do we teach folks about communities in a building that's 36 floors high in Oakland, far removed from the challenges and the things that, and the people, frankly, that we talk about. And so we immerse the class in the community, and ideally students were also doing their field placement in the neighborhood as well. So we're literally getting an immersion over the course of the semester. We use CBPR, community-based participatory research as our model, as we said, 
Uh, the goals, of course, of CBPR, you know, are, of course, knowledge development. We must be scholars. We must write. But by the same token, we also want to use the knowledge. The purpose of creating knowledge, from my perspective, is to use knowledge to bring about transformation and change. Here's a simple picture of kind of our model. We identify an issue we recognize as both academic and community knowledge, community knowledge bottom up, academic top down, if you like the picture, or flip it over if you want to. We review the academic and the community knowledge, because often community folks know a whole lot more about their communities than we do. Isn't that something? Like reading is pretty good, but living stuff is like a whole nother place. Really, it is. I, I, I'll tell you, if I have a time, I'll tell you an example. All right, so we design studies, we think about it, we talk to people, we listen, we look at the research, what does the literature say? We talk to old people in particular because they know stuff and they own homes and they've been there for a long time and they tell you stuff. So you put those two together and you design studies. Create your methods, create your design, create your interventions, you do your work, cycles back, you learn, you publish, you keep going. So we're agnostic with regard to methodology. We use secondary data, particularly as kind of, and I'll go over some of that stuff, sort of framing how we got where we are reason you're paying attention to me now is you don't believe those data that I showed you. You're like, good. You should see in your faces. You're like, good Lord. Those of you who are thinking about moving to Pittsburgh, you're like, what? <laughs> now, the white people are like, yeah, Pittsburgh. Son. Black people are like, no, I'm going to stay in Atlanta. All right. And then we collect a, a bunch of primary data, right? Talking to people, surveys, concept mapping, I got folks teaching me latent class analysis, all kinds of fancy new stuff, you know. So we do it all. Agnostic about method, but the point is, the methods don't drive, they don't drag us, the tail doesn't wag the dog. We use whatever method's appropriate to learn and understand the questions, all right? So one of the things that we started, we've mentioned, is the Home with Children's Village. Home with Children's Village, the place-based child center, comprehensive community initiative, inspired by the Harlem Children's Zone. Anybody familiar with the Children's Zone? Right, $119 million a year budget, we're not there. Right, Jeff Canada does it all, we do a little bit with a bunch of people so it adds up, right? Uh, our mission is simultaneously to improve the lives of young people and to reweave the fabric of the community we're sitting in. You can't just work with young people ignoring the context in which they live, right? Macro matters. I want my check after we get done. All right, and our vision is that Homewood's a community where every child succeeds. Now, I don't know about you, but I have had several experiences in my life, uh, one in Detroit, two in Pittsburgh, kind of shaped my work. This experience, uh, the picture is simply to remind me sort of a, a prompt for me. I was uh, going to a meeting with one of our funders and my colleague who's an alum University of Pittsburgh co-founded the Children's Village with me. And uh, I was at the YMCA in Homewood, preparing to, uh, or getting, getting ready to get on the elevator. And so uh, it was summer camp, and kids were running around. There was a little kid, four or five years old, a uh, little light-skinned kid, curly hair, actually reminded me of my, my own son. And so the camp counselor says to the young man, okay, everybody, let's get in a line. The little boy said, are we going to jail? Why does a four-year-old have schema? Psychology, that is. Why does a four-year-old have schema of going to jail? Being told to line up means that you're going to jail. There's something very, very, very when that comes out of the mouth of a child. And so this went from being academic and interesting and fascinating and give back to life work. It was real. And so the questions that I ask myself and the questions I want you to ask yourself are these. Do I want for others' children what I want for my own? See, because that changes everything. That question changes. So when you come into a room, a classroom, who do you see? Because you see, if you see other people's children, yeah. But if you see your children, everything changes. Did you ever notice you never called your own child bad? <laughs> right? You never say your own child is stupid, unless of course you're stupid. You don't say your own kid is stupid. 
right? You don't call your own child incorrigible.